Assalamualaikum. And peace be upon you all. I want to thank Imam Rashid Umar for inviting me to this mosque today. Uh, because, uh, as he mentions, we met some years back under not the best circumstances. The topic we have been asked to discuss is the issue of land. And uh, the issue of land has become uh, very exciting uh, since the ANC's elective conference in December last year. This mosque and many others stand at the center of the land question in South Africa. We very rarely think of it in those terms. But when I was growing up, I remember there was an extensive Muslim community here in this part of Cape Town. And it was a Muslim community that was both very industrious and also prosperous enough to support two mosques. There was this one here, and the other one was Stefan Road. There also used to be a school on Draper Street in those days, all serving the Muslim community that lived here. Oh, when I came back from exile in 1990, one found instead these shopping malls and what remained of the community with the two mosques. And uh, there's an explanation for that. And the explanation is the Group Areas Act, passed in 1951, three years after the National Party came into office. One is uncertain what happened to the community that used to be here, but it's left its mark here in the shape of its houses of worship. Now why I raise this is because there's a tendency when we talk about the land question in South Africa, people tend to think of farmland. People tend to think of land that's outside the urban areas. People even tend to think sometimes of land in what was called at one time the Bantu homelands. But that isn't what the land question is about. The land question is essentially about the right of every South African to feel a part of this country to which all our communities have contributed in one way or the other. Important comment by someone whom I don't usually quote, but which I think captures exactly what the issue is. And this is a gentleman by the name of Stephen Friedman, who wrote in the Mail and Guardian in March of this year. And he says, and I quote him, outsiders might be surprised that tensions caused by economic inequalities focus on land. Farming has not been South Africa's key industry for decades. The reason if, that is discussion of land, triggers such heat is that South Africans' land is the symbol of far more than an expanse of soil. For most people, it has nothing to do with agriculture at all. Historically, the demand by black freedom movements for the return of the land meant the return of the country to its people. It was directed not only at ownership of farms, but at minority control of the economy and society. This is why expropriation without compensation has become a rallying cry for so many who have no interest in farming, but who feel that a quarter century of democracy has not ended white privilege. 
it symbolizes a much broader demand for change. And I think that captures the essence of the land question as it relates to every community, but especially the historically oppressed communities here in South Africa. The interesting thing about the land question, not only here, but I think internationally, is that in many instances, the colonizing powers from Europe who came to occupy land in Africa, in Asia, in the Americas, in Oceania, were trying to solve their own land problem. There used to be a saying amongst the British ruling classes that because they have the system of primogenitor, that is the senior son, the eldest son, will inherit the title, will inherit the land, most of the property, the other sons have to be taken care of one way or the other. So the eldest son becomes the inheritor of the property. If there's another son and you want him to be able to make his way in the world, you send him into the army. If there was another one who you also wanted him to make his, world, make his way in the world, you send him into the church. And if he had a fourth son who was not very, very smart, he sent him to the colonies. And that is in fact what happened. That is in fact what happened. If you go back even to our own history here in this country, many of us, of us forget that why Van Griebeek was sent to South Africa was because he was being compelled to pay back money he had embezzled from the Dutch East India Company. Something that was underplayed in our textbooks in high school, in private school, but that's the truth. And you will find that in many instances, what European powers were trying to do was to solve their own problems of overcrowding, overpopulations in their societies, and send their excess population to occupy and take over other people's lands. And in the process of doing that, usually brought along with them the chains of enslavement, which accounts for the ancestry of a very large part of our own South African Muslim population. It brought with them also institutions such as the Shambok, and also imposed on the people that they found in the countries they came to occupy. All manner of laws. And Comte de Bourgeau, who commanded the French armies that conquered Algeria in the 1830s, says, in Europe, when you fight a war, what you do is you try to seize the city. And you try to seize the cities because that is where you will find the banks. That is where there will be the stock exchange. That will be the seat of government. That is the headquarters of the police. In Africa, what you do is you seize the land. And that is invariably what happened in all colonial societies and in all colonial situations. And I think we can see the sort of heat and passion that seizure of other people's land excites when we look at what is happening on the border between Gaza and Israel every day. Massacres on the scale of Shabu happening there virtually every day because the land of the Palestinian people has been seized by other people who claim to have biblical rights to it. Don't know how to get into that. But the fact of the matter is historically that is land and that was Palestinian land which has been seized. Equally, 
Here in our country, we very rarely think about a massacre such as Shrapa, or the one that happened here in London in 1960, as relating to the issue of land. But think about this, that in 1913, white colonial racist government passes a law called the Native Land Act, which says in land, in legislative language, stamp of authority of the Governor General and the King, no African, no person of African descent may own and have access to land in 87% of the land area of the country. And that 87% contains all the major cities, contains the best agricultural land. The only part of South Africa in which an African can have any claim is 13% of the land. That means if you want to go to Johannesburg, you are going to a place where you may not claim land. If you're coming to Cape Town, you're coming to Port Elizabeth, to Durban, anyway, you have no right to own land there. And to go there, you need, therefore, a don't pass. And to move in that city, you need a special pass, a nach pass, a track pass, a this pass, a that pass, an other pass. And that is what Shapu was about. At the base, the issue of land. Now, we talk about the 87% and the 37, 13%. But there are, of course, the other oppressed communities in South Africa. People who were referred to as colors, others referred to as Indians and Asians, who also were part of this society. Group Alias Act 1951 says certain parts of Cape Town are exclusively for the whites. And if you live there, well, too bad, you have to move. 1946, Asiatic Land Kenya Act. There are certain parts of the cities, especially it was in Natal, Peter Madison, Devon and others, which are exclusively for whites. And if you're Indian, you have to live there too bad, you have to move. And it doesn't just say you have to move. They actually back it up with action. And we know about forced removals. Some carried out by pressure, some at gunpoint. And entire communities lost what they had built, what they had constructed, what they had cherished. I met an old friend, Yusuf Abrams, who grew up in this community which used to be here. I think he's moved somewhere else to a partial part of town. <laughs> ah, but he has strong feelings about this community, so he is still in this masjid, and that's commendable. But what are we going to do about the people who lost their land here. What are we going to do about the millions of others who have been dispossessed of their right to land in South Africa? Now these are questions which are highly emotive and make people very angry. <laughs> but we have to be very careful and deliberative about it. Because sometimes when we react emotionally to these issues, we make terrible mistakes. What I'm talking about, this possession of African people, indigenous people of their land, happened everywhere where there were white settler colonies in Africa. Here in Namibia, Zimbabwe, Kenya, Algeria. Our friends in Zimbabwe were angry about this issue but not thinking very clearly, say, no, no, we'll just touch it. Beat 
the white farmer up, take the land. Beat up that man, take his land. That man, beat him up, take his land. Go into the streets here, and lots of brothers from Zimbabwe didn't actually help David. It didn't help David to emotionally react to the issue of the land and say, no, no, take it from the white farmer. Didn't help. There are thousands of Zimbabweans in the streets of South Africa. And I was commenting the other day when I called up the municipal council to fix my electricity. And an African fellow comes along with a colored fellow. And I say to the African fellow, my brother, where do you come from? Because he couldn't speak any of our local languages. And he says, Zimbabwe. And I say, oh, not going back now that Emerson is in power? And he says, my brother, I want to wait and see. But that is sometimes what happens if you act too angrily about these things. Now, what we have to weigh in our own situation here in South Africa is the experience of other parts of the world and also to think about our own history. So solving the land question has been one of the most difficult issues confronting transformative and revolutionary governments, especially during the 20th century. I think with the exception of Cuba, land reform in most of the countries that have tried to solve the land question by revolutionary means has been attended by a great deal of violence. Perhaps because Cuba is 60 miles, 90 miles from the United States, the people were would have caused the violence left and then tried to come back from outside but didn't stay in Cuba, which is maybe why they were able to solve it. But in other parts of the world, it has been very, very, very difficult to resolve it. One thing, for example, in Russia after the revolution, and one thing about Eastern Europe, one thing about China and countries such as those. So the Land question isn't one of those things that one should take easily for granted and think that there are shortcuts to solve it. Which is why we want to appeal for deliberative debate. And the land question in our own country evolved over centuries. Essentially involving the dispossession of indigenous people, the enslavement of others. And as a result of that, the patterns of land ownership and the patterns of exploitation in relation to land and land ownership in South Africa have been very different. You had a system of slavery in the Dutch East India Company colony here in the Cape, taken over by the British in 1806, who abolished slavery in 1958. <laughs> You had on the farms, in and around Cape Town, the remnants of the Khoi and the Sand people. Now the mandate that the Dutch East India Company got from its king said that they may not enslave the people in South Africa. Those in Indonesia and Madagascar and Sri Lanka, what, what, oh, oh yeah, yeah, those you can enslave. But these ones here you can't touch. So they developed a sort of neo-feudal relationship with the Khoi Khoi and the Sand. And that system of exploitation was transported by the four trekkers when they went into and built their republics in the Free State and the Transvaal. It was only in the Cape and in the Tal, where after the abolition of slavery, you had a system of so-called freehold, which was theoretically non racial Which was why you could actually have communities like the one here in Claremont, District 6, Bukka, Weinberg, Constantia, and others develop. 
which is why you could have evolved, for example, in the Eastern Cape, a stratum of very wealthy African farmers who could compete on equal terms with their white counterparts on the market producing wool, grain, and other products. But the majority of people in the country either occupied land on a communal basis or occupied land as tenant farmers in the Free State and the Transvaal. Many of the African people who had been conquered by the Boers lived as tenant farmers on those farms. Again, that neo-feudal system that they brought with them from the Cape. So when you had that unification of South Africa in 1910, you had very different. They created the land bank, which makes available money and loans for whites only. Thank you very much. Knowing that the next year, lots of Africans are going to be compelled to sell their property at fire sale prices because they may no longer own land in a town like Kimberley or Johannesburg or Durban, etc. They have to sell. And of course, this white guy there with some money from the land bank can buy a property. Why not? Same thing happened after the Asiatic Land Tenure Act, 46. And again, Group A is Act, 1951. Facilitate whites acquiring land which you are compelling people who are not white to sell. So what the thrust of land ownership here in South Africa was, was to consolidate in the hands of the whites, the white minority, the best land, the highest quality land, the most attractive land, and to compel everyone else into the worst possible land, and so on. So what we had developed in South Africa is conquest and dispossession, on the one hand, enslavement, a coercive process of transforming the indigenous people, the majority, into workers and laborers on your farms, which culminates in systems of labor tenancy and wage slavery. And it is a system that is upheld through native reserves, and the native reserves played a very important function in the system because African families could not come into the urban areas, you are outsourcing the responsibility, usually assumed by urban governments and others. You are outsourcing that responsibility of bringing up children and taking care of the aged, the injured, and disabled to African women in rural areas. Now, why? Would liberation movements in South Africa therefore not privilege the land question? And every liberation movement that has evolved in this country has placed the land question at the center of its program. Stated strongly in certain cases, stated in more moderate terms than others. But the right to acquire to buy and sell land in any part of the country has been at the center of every program that you have seen since 1935. During the Second World War, for example, the ANC adopted the African claims and it addresses the land question in clauses six and seven of that document as follows. Recognition of the sanctity or inviolability of the home as a right of every family and the prohibition of police raids on citizens in their homes for tax, for liquor, or other purposes. The right to own, buy, hire, or lease and occupy land and all other forms of immovable as well as movable property. And the repeal of restrictions on this right in the Natives Land Act the Native Trust and Land Act, the Native Urban Areas Act, and the Native Laws Amendment Act. 
was good. During that same period, another movement, the non-European movement established here in the Western Cape, also adopted a program on land, saying that the land should be redistributed in accordance with the above. That is, in accordance with the democratic principles stated before that. The land clause in the 10-point program was uh, point number 10. Elaborating on the African claims in 1955, the Congress Alliance adopted the Freedom Charter. And in that document, it addresses the land question the following terms. And I quote, the land shall be shared amongst those who work it. The restrictions of land ownership on a racial basis shall be ended, and all the land be divided amongst those who work it to banish famine and land hunger. The state shall help the peasants with implement seeds, tractors, and dams to save the soil and assist the tillers. Freedom of movement shall be guaranteed to all who work on the land. All shall have the right to occupy land wherever they choose. People shall not be robbed of their cattle, and forced labor and farm prisons will be abolished." End quote. That was elaborated upon in another document adopted by the ANC in 69, in which it says, and I quote, the bulk of the land in our country is in the hand of land barons, absentee landlords, big companies and state capitalist enterprises. The land must be taken away from exclusive European control and from these groupings and divided amongst small farmers, peasants and landless of all races who do not exploit the labor of others. Close quote. So then what? were all these liberation movements saying. Others that were founded later, like the PAC, founded in 1959, Black Consciousness Movement, founded in the 60s, would all agree with those words that I've read before. They would have no quarrel with them. All of them placed the land and the land question at the center of their concerns. Yet, one cannot say that this question, which is central to every liberation movement's program, has actually been addressed since we had democracy in this country. And the question does arise, why? And many people have many explanations for it. Those who want to deny that there is such a thing as white privilege will tell you that, no, 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 why the land question has not been addressed is because the ANC government has evaded it. And in a cowardly manner now is talking about the Constitution, and wants to change the constitution, and blah, 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 blah. Might be true, might be false. But at the same time, too, at the same time, too, when one talks about issues like who owns and who controls the land, and how land should be returned to those who lost it, they have no answers. Now the proposals that emerge from most of the liberation movements tend to suggest that the land should be taken away from the white landlords and land barons and that it should be unbundled and given to small farmers. Now, when we consider our own particular situation in South Africa, would that be an intelligent solution? Well, let's examine it. Right now, most of the food, if you go across the street to pick and pay, 
go around the corner to Woolworths or any of the big supermarkets, most of the food that is sold and marketed there doesn't come from small farmers. It comes from big agri-business farms. And these agri-business farms sometimes are linked to the big corporations that uh, we find in the mineral and energy complex of the South African economy. They employ hundreds of workers. They are highly recognized and usually greatly invested in terms of capital in those farms. Now, would taking over those farms, just as it might be, <coughs> Give South Africa the sort of food security we have at present? And the answer to that is no. So, that's not the way to address our land question. Because if we did that, we would have to unbundle these big farms and distribute them in small little pieces to people who want to be farmers. How many South Africans who live in urban areas at present do you think want to become farmers? How many of the kids in any of the high schools here in Cape Town want to become farmers? How many of those in high schools in Durban and Dover want to become farmers? I don't think very many. So, again, there's that issue. Then we have to weigh also, what is a course of action that entails just taking the farms away and unbundling them in this way? What is that going to do for our food supply here in this country? And considering that we export a lot of it, what is going to happen to that export market? But at the same time too, we look at these big farms, and I've had instances of having to deal with some of them. My parliamentary constituency when I was an MP was Somerset West, where there are quite a number of farms of nature I'm talking about producing wine, producing fruit, etc. And uh, you find on those farms families who have lived and worked on those farms for generations. For generations. You also know that the farm workers in South Africa historically have been the most vulnerable. Subject to all sorts of abuses, beatings by farmers. There's the notorious tax system which used to be practiced and is still practiced in some of our farming areas. And the working conditions are often degrading. Now, given that then, what does justice demand that we do? Someone who's worked on a farm for generations, that is, generations of his family have invested in that farm. And getting very little in return, what does justice demand we do? Very tough question. Now, Uncle Bob next door says, take the farm and beat up the farm and drive him away. We could do that, but I don't advise it. <coughs> Then we also have to talk about systems of land ownership. Do we want to have systems of land ownership that merely entail giving land to people and uh, giving them title deeds to it and then not having any backup systems, so to speak, to sustain and maintain them. That could open up 
these people to dispossession of their land by banks, by speculators and others. So should we perhaps be talking about other forms of land ownership and should we perhaps be exploring the sorts of options that you find in other places, cooperatives, etc. Lastly, one wants to talk about the land in what were referred to as the Bantu homelands. This is a sector which is dominated by women as tillers. And the system that was devised by the colonial and racist regimes endowed the traditional leaders with the right to distribute land. We want to retain that. What forms of support does one need for the women who are the tillers in these places? And one has to take particular notice of a remark made by former President Salimun Mutante recently. And he says traditional leaders act like tin pot village dictators. And I quote, in continuing his criticism of tribal leaders, he says it was rare to find ones who did not think they had the right to claim land. What we heard from public hearings, with the exception of the Eastern Cape, the only traditional leaders who understand they are representatives of the people are the traditional leaders of the Eastern Cape. Others call themselves Bengu, that is, owners of the land. In other words, what has happened as a result of the homeland system is that that so-called traditional system of land distribution is now evolving into a system of landlordism where these traditional leaders are now going to claim they own the land and are going to rent it to the people who are put on their subjects. As I said, urban land is also at the center of the land question. And we know, and our experience here in Cape Town in particular, tells us that what happened was the colonialization of our living space and our cities. We still have cities that have a white city center and then the native quarter. And the native quarter is usually in the worst part of town. But in order to change the urban geography of South Africa, we are going to have to win the cooperation of those who now control the land. Are they going to be willing to offer that cooperation willingly? That's a very big question. Are they going to offer that cooperation willingly? Or will one have to take coercive measures? Now those coercive measures did not be like going and beating up the farmer and taking his land. You can do it through the law. And that is what we have to seriously explore in South Africa. Which is why Parliament has set up that commission which is examining the law with a view to addressing the land question. Thank you.